Hello, everybody. So it's absolutely great to welcome you to this month's live event. It's interactive and it's going to be very interesting because the Crowdcast platform changed today. So I've had a slight IT practice and meltdown and hopefully you can hear me. So for those of you new, there's a chat box down in the bottom right. I think it's down there. Do say hi where you're from because we're reaching such a wide audience. I've been absolutely overwhelmed by how many people have signed up. So hi, Patrick. Really nice to see you again. So welcome, a really warm welcome if you attended the January um, live event and you've come back. A fantastic welcome if this is your first time. It will be great um, for you to just get a bit orientated around the screen. So the first thing is I want to check because I can't see what you see. Can you hear me and see me all right? We've in, invested in some software, so hopefully the, the picture and the sound is better than it was last time. So if somebody could put in the chat room, whether they, great sound, thank you, Heather. Just a bit of feedback, because it's sort of blind this end. A little bit of echo, okay. All right, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. All the way from New Zealand, Karen, looking and sounding good. Thank you for that, that's great. So. I'm Barbara Holding, I'm a chartered physiotherapist and I'm a veterinary physiotherapist. And I started my career in 1983 and in the mid 90s, I moved into canine um, physiotherapy and rehabilitation. It's my passion. And what's fantastic is all of you have given up your time to come and attend this evening um, because we have this bond, this complete passion for dogs, which is brilliant. And we've still got people arriving in the box. I've been warned by Crowdcast, I'm well over my limit because I had no idea we would have, we've trebled the sign up. I can't believe it. So we tested this forum in November, just a bit of a test to see how it would go. And we're launching this monthly live interactive session um, every month this year for 2019. And thank you for all the support and all the emails you've sent. I've just been completely overwhelmed. So if I know you from ACPAT's Core Knowledge and Skills course and met you then when I wrote, delivered and examined that course, please say hi. If I know you from the Royal Veterinary College, where I was a lecturer there for 10 years for the small animal component and a clinical educator and examiner, please tell me that's where we met and say hi. Um, if I met you on the PG Cert at Nottingham Vet School, um, where I was a co-director there for four years, which was a level seven canine rehab course. So we did hydrotherapy, veterinary physiotherapy and rehabilitation. Um, please say hi. If I know you from Canine Hydro Services, which was actually set up for the Royal Veterinary College as a satellite training center, we've been open 10 years. Um, if you're an owner, a trainer, a therapist, a professional, please let me know. Oh, thank you, Hannah. RVC days, lots of great memories. Yeah, it was it was great. Intense for the course, definitely, but great. So, I've not met you in person. I'm really, really thrilled that you've come to join and hopefully we'll meet up sometime. And I just want to share a little bit about um, what we've been doing the last couple of years and it's been in response to you. So if you like this interactive opportunity, you like a chance to ask questions, you like sharing some information, you've got to feed back to me and tell me so I keep going on with this because it's nerve wracking, but it's really exciting to be able to reach so many people. Um, it's fantastic. So I don't know, have we got anybody from Ireland in the house? I have a great contingent and some great friends in Ireland as well. New Zealand, I know you're there, fantastic. Just reading through, canine HS therapist, Sarah, my clinical manager, awesome person. Okay, so to be honest, as I said, I'm totally overwhelmed by the sign up with this. Um, it's new um, information that I'm trying to get out to you and um, I'm trying to sort of give you something where we can link CEPT course and canine HS course. Hi, Amanda. Okay. Rebecca from Ireland living in York. That's so random because all my family live in York. That's so weird. And I have a little cottage in Ireland along the um, wild Atlantic way. So, wow, it's just brilliant. So the chat box, just to orientate you, is down on the right. There's a poll underneath me down below. Hopefully I'm pointing to it. Um, that's a poll just to look at the most popular breeds that you're seeing if you're a therapist. I've got seven questions building up. 
please don't put any questions in the chat box. If you've already posted a question in the chat box, please write it again and ask a question. Because what happens is I don't want to lose it. What happens is it gets moved up with the chat box and, and I want to make sure I answer as many questions as possible. The questions are time stamped, and what that means is if I get the tech right, I can press it on and off. So if you want to watch the replay and see um, an answer to a question, you can just go and look at that question, which is an awesome facility. Um, and the poll, again, you can you can um, enter that now and we can have a look at the end. It's been going since you've been signing up. The questions, you can upvote them. And what that means is you can vote on the questions and it moves. But last time what happened was when I went in to answer the questions, the votes were still on, so I lost some of the questions. So please, when I go into the question box, I'll just give you a warning if you could just stop voting so I can read the question and answer it. I just don't want to miss any of your questions. Okay, and we've got 87 people here in the house. We've got 281 registered and, and hopefully we don't pop the clogs and go over the limit because um, that's an interesting thing for Crowdcast and me. So just going to pull up the slides. Got some lovely slides to, to um, show you. Hopefully this is working. Again, in the chat box, can you just tell me if you can see the slides? I should have the, the front slide there, Dogs in Natural Balance Motion, and that's what it's all about. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, Ruby. That really helped me so much. Okay, so I want you to think about your movement sequences. I want you to think about what you've done in the last 20 minutes, 10 or 12 movement sequences, because movement is organized in sequences, not in discrete. Hi, Maria. Thank you. Great to see you here. Thank you, Amanda. Great to know that it's going well. Okay, so you can see what I can see, hopefully. So humans have about 2 million sequences plus, depending on your skill base, whereas dogs have about 10,000 movement sequences. So if you're old school like me and you've got a, ped, a pad and pen, jot down the last 10 movements you did or write it in the chat box, what have you done? So did you make a cup of coffee? Have you eaten your food? Did you do up a button? Are you writing something? What I need to know is what were the last 10 movement sequences you did, okay? And then I want you to think about your lovely dog or a dog you know, and I want you to think about the last 10 movement sequences they did. It's really different. They might have done some grooming. They might have got up and moved forwards. Maybe they went into a sit position. Um, maybe they went to the toilet. And what you can see is there's a huge difference in how dogs organize their movement compared to humans. And that's why we need specific understanding of their normal movement patterns before we can improve it. So I'm biased because my default is a therapist. So I'm looking at making the dog move their most efficient in natural balance. Um, and we get amazing results by doing this therapeutically, by improving movement, whether it's um, a top athlete and you're trying to enhance their performance, whether it's a rehabilitation case post-injury or post-surgery, whether it's an elderly dog going off their back legs. And so by helping the dog move in the innate natural balance motion that they're designed to do, we get amazing results really quickly. Excellent. So Sarah's telling me she's brushed her dog, she's worked on a laptop and made a drink. Well, we all know that dogs can't work on laptops or make drinks. Patrick, preparing PT courses while my dog sleeps. Exactly, so I want you to think about the movement sequences you do and the movement sequences a dog does, okay? Because by understanding canine movement, we can then reliably assess that dog's fitness levels, movement levels, enjoying life, um, and also from a rehabilitation point of view, be able to reliably assess their abnormal movement patterns so we can make a difference. So I just have to toggle here. You just have to bear with me. Those who know me will know that IT is definitely my challenge. Okay, so what is canine locomotion all about? It's basically about two things. It's about the product of proprioception and muscles. Um, and Professor Alexander, lifetime, he's a biomechanist, lifetime of research, 
I'm not going to be able to pull out one or two papers, just go and look him up and all the other biomechanics. So this is established, we're going to deep dive into science and base our decision making on sound fact, which I think is really important. So the proprioceptive system, what is that? It's a neural feedback mechanism um, and it's key in organizing balanced movement sequences and also in preventing injuries, which is really important. And muscles, what are muscles all about? Well, they are the force capacitor. They generate the power for movement. Bernadette, she's pouring fizz. Have you been on the ski slopes today, coming for a cuddle lying down at your voice? That's what I'm liking to hear. Dogs coming in to, to see what's going on. Thank you, Bernadette. Okay, so think about the sequences you've been doing. Think about the skills you have. You write, you drive, you type. Um, you dress, you do buttons, you put on jewelry, you eat. These are not movement sequences that dogs need. They need a whole set of different movement sequences. And so we need to understand how they organize that if we want to improve it. So this is where we need very specific skills for, for dogs and they're gonna be very different to human skills. Um, so I really want you to then start thinking about the different breeds. So let's have a look at the poll. I'm just having a bring the poll up. I'm just going to, sorry, just. Uh... So Labrador Retrievers, well in, well in ahead. They're one of our most popular breeds. Stunningly this year they weren't. They've been top of the pops really, or top of the dogs for 17 years. Border Collies, German Shepherd dogs. So what I want you to think about is within the species, within the canine species, I want you to think about the differences between the different breeds. So a border collie has low angled hocks because, and they can creep so they can go down and that helps them with herding, tight turning, and they, their design, their biomechanical design is for that. Whereas a low angled hocks and being able to creep would be abnormal for a racing greyhound. They've got long perpendicular legs. So within this species, we've got so many different breeds and it's not just a sizing issue, it's different conformation and different sizing. So we also have to think within each breed, there's so many different shapes and sizes. So that's the challenge for us to think about. Um, so within there, we need a whole range of therapeutic treatment techniques. So we want to build as therapists a really big toolbox of therapeutic treatment techniques. So we've got something for every dog in our care. There we go, love this picture so much. So I want you to think about human movement and canine movement. There's four main types of movement we need to think about. The most simple movement that we have are called reflexes. Um, reflexes like your knee jerk, flexor withdrawal, um, pupil dilation. Um, these are involuntary responses to sensory input. There's no threshold, so they just come. They're a defense mechanism to protect the body from harm. Um, they're the simplest form of movement um, and they're all about defense of the body. So as a therapist, I'm not going to opt to use reflexes as a treatment technique. So when we're looking at the second group of um, movements that dogs and humans can do, they're called fixed action patterns. Now your fixed action patterns, they're like sneezing and coughing. Um, again, it's an involuntary response, like reflexes, it's involuntary. Um, but what they do is they have a threshold that they meet. So they're a bit more complex than reflexes, whereas reflexes are the most simplest form of movement. These are involuntary responses. Um, and um, th so the threshold is something that has to be reached before they're triggered. So the third group of movement that we're really interested in as therapists and people involved as trainers, people involved as owners with their dogs, are rhythmic motor patterns. And this is a really important group in canine rehabilitation and canine movement. And these are like walking, trotting, galloping, swimming, running, scratching, breathing. These are repetitive, complex patterns. They're subject to continuous voluntary control. And what that means is they're absolutely instrumental in understanding these because this is what drives canine gait. It's what drives canine swimming action, okay? And the fourth group 
their directed movements. Now, directed movements are voluntary and they're complex. They're usually not repetitive. So as a human physiotherapist, I'm very obsessed with the fourth group directed movement because it's very relevant to human rehabilitation and the background movement that they have will fall into group three but as a canine physiotherapist and as a canine hydrotherapist and rehabilitator i am completely obsessed with group three the rhythmic motor patterns because that is what dogs use innately for every part of their life the directed movements which we'll go into a little bit later, are the learned patterns that we teach dogs that are useful for them, but they shouldn't be used as the primary treatment tools. Um, so sit up at beg, I'm sitting to verbal command, I'm not going to use those as a therapist because they're not that useful for the dog in the long, in the long term. So we're just looking at these four major types of movement. I would never use a reflexive treatment technique because I know I'd have to do that for such a long time because it's a simple form of movement. Um, there's no threshold, so it's not very fair for the dog. So I would always opt for a rhythmic motor pattern treatment technique. So just moving on from there. And there you can see a beautiful dog um, and moving in balance, and we've got two points of control. And the two points of control are helping the therapist guide the dog so they are consciously mediating, so they are actively engaging in a movement pattern that's being directed is totally different to them running out in the field, running out off lead, and it's very different to them walking on the lead where there's a partnership where you're connected, but you're not actively helping the dog balance. So that's what I want to sort of explore a little bit today. Okay, so Bernadette, you made it from skiing, which is great. Thank you very much for letting me use one of your slides. So Bernadette attended the level five advanced canine hydrotherapy course that we ran last year and was extremely successful and this is a part of one of her many assignments so i really appreciate it so i want to talk a little bit about the proprioceptive system so now we're thinking about what kind of movements dog use and we're also thinking about a little bit about muscles generate the power for movement and we now are thinking about the types of movement because it really matters whether you're an owner or a trainer or a therapist you understand which group of mus which group of movements you're actually going to um, utilize in developing your treatment techniques or the approach or the way you move your dog. So um, the proprioceptive system is complicated. It's a neural feedback system and we've got receptors and what they're like are satellites and they pick up sensory information and we have them internally and we have them externally. We have a huge number in dogs in their paws. They have special ones in their eyes. Um, it's linked to their vestibular apparatus, so in the inner ear, which is very crucial to it. And you can find these proprioceptors in muscles, ligaments, fascia, joints. Um, we also um, access and use the sensory receptors in the skin. And all this information is incoming. So think about your laptop and you've gone shopping and you're going to go buy yourself something new. You will go to lots of different sites online. So you have a lot of incoming into your laptop. So we've got all this incoming information. It comes up the afferent fibers, which is the sensory fibers, and it goes to the mainframe, to your laptop, which is the central nervous system. So the central nervous system has multitasks, but a lot of that is integrating the information, storing the information, actioning. What's really interesting is, the afferent fibers, the incoming, you've got 100, 100,000 fibers coming in. Your output through your efferent or the output from the mainframe laptop to your printer, to the muscles, to be able to action them, we've only got about 10,000. So we've got a huge amount of incoming information, a lot of white noise and chatter. A lot of it is stored in the memory banks. Only a small amount of that goes down the motor neuron, which is the efferent pathway to the end organ or the muscle. And so when we're looking at it from a therapist point of view, we're looking at affecting the quality of the information through that input to maximize the output. So the proprioceptive system is this neural feedback system, and it's very, very important because it's one of the main elements of movement. 
So where it gets very interesting for me as a human physiotherapist and as a veterinary physiotherapist is that it's completely different between the two species. So your efferent pathway, your motor pathway in humans, we've got two main motorways. Imagine it as an A road or your main motorway and a B road. The main motorway for humans is called the pyramidal system because of those movements you were thinking about what you did. So we have complicated graded movements. We can undo buttons, we can put on our glasses, we can write, we can eat, we can play instruments, we learn to swim, we learn a pattern of movement to swim, it's not innate within us. We have a sequence we have to repeat quite a few times as a directed movement. We get congratulated with a badge and someone clapping us. We nearly drown on the five, five meter width, okay? It's not innate within us. So we have directed movement. And so the pyramidal system for us is our main frame. It's our main motorway. It's really important. And our background is called the extra pyramidal system. And that's the B road. And that is our background posture, um, background voluntary actions that we have to do to live. So it's not so significant to us. However, in the dog, it's completely the opposite. So natural balance motion is about the dog's innate default, the computer within it that uses the extra pyramidal. So our B road is their main A road. And that main A road is what they do every day they live, where they get up, move forwards. They are designed to move forwards. They are not designed to walk backwards. That's a maneuver that they can do, but they are designed to move forwards. They run forwards. They do agility forwards. You know, so if they learn a sequence and it's a directed learn movement, maybe they'll have that in their own movement repertoire. But most dogs move forwards, they toilet, they get up, they scratch, they groom, they lick, they eat, they drink, they sniff. They're their movement patterns and they sit in the extra pyramidal pathway. And their background, their B road, the road that isn't so significant for them is the learn directed movements humans teach their lovely dogs to sit to a command, not sit because they're being held in balance and then guided into that sit. It's where they've learned to sit up and beg. They've learned something in association with something else. So that is a voluntary movement that they've been directed and learned. And that's their background movement. So let's have a look at this natural balance movement that sits in their main pathway because it's so important if you want to improve movement and you want to have a positive effect. So part of that main frame, part of that central nervous system is something called CPGs. They are part of the main central nervous system. And they're also known as central processing generators. So it's confusing when you've got two names for the same thing, but there's some anatomy that's got several names. It's just time marks when you learn your anatomy. And these CPGs, we've got them and dogs have got them. And this is where the science is really interesting to know because you can now link this to your clinical choices, whether you're a therapist, whether you're an owner, you're, oh, try to enlarge, but went blurry. Can't read in for one slide. Can you enlarge? Thank you. Let me just see what I've done um, there. Is that better? Thank you, Lynn. Is that better? Can you see it? Maria, let me know. Can you hear me? All right, I've had a bit of feedback about the slides. Yes, it was the last slide. Okay, so is it just the last slide of the proprioception? Can you see this one clearly? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Lynn. Sorry about that. Okay, so, right, so the central patterning generators, they're very, very important because they drive canine gait. They drive canine swimming. This is what organizes and runs canine movement. And if you're into dogs, thank you, Maria. Thanks for the feedback. Because I'm doing this blind. I can only see my screen. I can't see what you guys see. It's really helpful to just keep giving me the chat. If the voice goes or the, the, the vision goes, let me know. So central pattern generators, central processing generators, CPGs, all the same thing. We've got a few and we have them in our spine. They're spinally placed. And what they are are mini neural networks. They're circuitry that's linked to the mainframe. 
Dogs have loads of them, and this relates to what I was saying. So for us, pyramidal movement, so fine graded movement, directed learning movement sequences is profoundly important for us. We have arms because we have a hand at the end of it, okay? Dogs have a pyramidal system, but theirs runs out by the time they get to the brachium, their upper arm and their cruds, because they don't need that movement. They need natural balance movement, which sits in the extra pyramidal pathway. And what we do know from dogs is they've got loads of CPGs and that their movement patterns are driven by these mini neural circuitry. We don't have a lot. We have a few and we have tried to access them to generate this kind of spinally led movement, but it doesn't happen. There was a terrible, terribly sad case with Christopher Reeve. He was an amazing actor, one of the, I think he was the first Superman and he was like my hero and he had a terrible um, uh, injury falling off a horse. And he tried to generate his few CPGs into activating movement, but he couldn't for a biped. But for dogs, completely different. This is how they organize and drive their activities. So if we want to improve their walking, if we want to improve their swimming, we want to access and influence the CPGs. And we can do that because they can respond to sensory feedback and we can alter patterning and we can map into the way dogs are automatically defaulted into moving. So there's something else we need to think about with, with dog movement as well. We're just thinking very scientifically of the, we haven't got to the biomechanics, we're just thinking of the neural system at the moment. We also have to think about dogs' motivation. They are amazing. And if it's a border collie and they see a ball, they can be very over-motivated and they can move out of balance. So using motivators, whether it's the owner, whether it's food treats, toys, you've, you've got to have the skills to use those motivators and help the dog keep in their natural balance. If you're moving the dog in water, you are finding their center of buoyancy and helping them move in balance. And as they progress, you will see they move more efficiently. So moving in balance means they're going to move efficiently and, um, and, and powerfully. Whereas when they're out of balance because of injury, because of some underlying problem, um, because they've had proprioceptive loss that's um, gone on since an injury, we're going to see their movement become inefficient, less effective, and they're gonna alter and have secondary patterning, which um, in the long run, overloads other structures and joints and muscles, which we don't want. So just again, bear with me with the slides. Can you just tell me if you can see that slide all right? Is that okay? Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Tracy. Fantastic. So we now need to think about these muscles. These muscles are really important. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Melissa. Um, let's think about the kind of muscle contraction. So the muscles are the power of movement. The muscles are what generate and they are the force capacitor. They are what give the dog the power to move. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Sarah. We've got two kinds of muscle contraction we want to think about. We've got isotonic exercise, which is dynamic. And we've got isometric exercise, which is static. And if you're going to rehabilitate, you have to access both these. But what's really important to understand with dogs is isotonic exercise. We've got two kinds of muscle contraction. We've got concentric contraction, which is where your muscle shortens. And we have eccentric contraction where your muscle lengthens. Now, eccentric contraction has a higher output. And agility dogs, 99% of their movement is eccentric contraction. So as a therapist, we need to involve um, particular movement therapies that incorporates concentric muscle contraction and eccentric muscle contraction of our targeted muscles. We also must include isometric exercise and we can use um, closed chain and open chain kinetic exercise as well. So no human physio would get somebody up out of bed and drag them along the wall. What we would do is we would help them transfer from one posture to another. We would help them write themselves and so they're not too dizzy. We would practice some directed learning movement of some transfers. We would hold them in a balanced stand. We would do 
static work first before we introduce dynamic work. And it's exactly the same with the dogs. But you need to understand the kind of muscle power that they need to use for their role. So again, hopefully you can see this slide. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if my curse is on there. So what actually controls voluntary muscle? So it's all about that group three and group four. And this is where it gets really interesting because so I notice a lot of people are using the group four movement for rehabilitating dogs. So you're gonna have to do so much more and it's not that relevant to the dog's movement. Whereas if you work with the dog in natural balance motion, you're going to have such an impact in such a few sessions. So the cerebellum, it regulates your motor control. The cerebellum is a small part of your brain that's incredibly important. It sits under the cerebrum at the top of the spinal, um, uh, at the top of the spinal cord and is integrated into um, everywhere there. Um, it receives information from your sensory systems. It receives information from your um, spinal cord, from your CPGs and other parts of the brain. It's all about coordinating voluntary motion, which is what we're concerned about when we're working with dogs. Um, so it is coordinating your voluntary motion. It is in co coordinating your balance and your posture and coordination of movement, so we have a smooth, balanced muscular activity. And that's the same for humans and the same for dogs, as long as we're actioning the right group of movements that we want to target. So we've got postures in lying, and we've got balance in lying. And you can see that from, you can see, think of your dogs and think of all the different ways you see them lie. They may lay on their back, they may lay on their side, they may lay like a sphinx and they move from one lying position to another. That is posture and that is balance. That is very important. We can have segmental balance. So we've got a gorgeous little picture here of Lily, and you can see that she is balancing her head on her body. So we've got segmental balance and positioning and posture, as well as global posture. So here, standing in that balance stand, I don't know if you can see the cursor, I'm not sure if you can see the cursor on the screen where I'm showing you, so hopefully you can. So we've got different postures in different um, positions. We've got different balance in different postures. And then really importantly, we've got posture which is dynamic. So we have posture when we move and we have posture and balance when we stand. And so we have static posture and balance. We also know the transfers from one posture to another are massively proprioceptively enriched if they're guided and the dog moves in balance. We also know the transition phases where we move from one speed to another speed is hugely proprioceptively enriched if the dog is guided and moved in balance. So what's really interesting is the proprioceptive system for the dog does not need to switch on when the dog is running around the field. If the dog is off lead, running around the field, the proprioceptive system, it may be on standby, but it is not on because dog's movement is automated by the CPGs. It's spinally automated. And we know that when the dog goes into an underwater treadmill or goes into the water in the pool, innately, the dog has not learned to swim at a swimming class. The dog has an innate pattern that comes through its natural balance system that it kicks in because it needs to survive the event. It is its default. And what we do is we introduce the dog to understand how to find that balanced stand. And that balanced stand may not be at the beginning of the program, but we're aiming to get that dog in balance at some point through our program. And an owner moving the dog, we want that experience where the dog understands how to move in balance um, with their owner and a trainer. We, they're wanting the dog to move in balance because they want them to win the competition. And a dog that moves in balance is going to be really efficient. It's going to have its best movement patternings that it can have. So with motivation, motivation can be very positive to help the dog achieve what we want, but also motivation can help, if it's a really strong drive, take the dog out of balance. We can move one segment on another segment so we know that head movement if we lift the head up if we lift the head up it's passive if the dog raises its head or brings it down it can alter its balance by 10 to 15 percent through the four quarters 
So these are significant um, facts that we can use as a therapist in a positive way with our therapeutic treatment technique box. So just any questions? So we've got seven questions there. So I thought I'd just stop, have a little look at the questions, see if there's anything I can um, help you go through. We've got a few more slides reviewing that biomechanics and understanding a little bit more about that balance movement and a balanced stand. So I'm just going to open the questions. If you can not vote for them at the moment, so I don't lose the questions, so I'll read it out. Um, I, again, I'm not sure what you're seeing because Crowdcast changed their layout today. Um, ah, first one. Uh, for Bernadette, thank you, Bernadette. When will your level six natural balance motion course be online and how many hours is it? Really interesting, we're aiming for May. The merry month of May, we will be releasing it. The reason it's going to take a little longer, Bernadette, is because as well as the Crowdcast offering you an interactive forum, asking questions and sharing information um, every month, the other thing that I've been occupied in response to the feedback from everybody is developing my canine technical videos. And these canine TVs are excruci excruciatingly difficult to create. I've got a small team now and they take a long time to get what we want, but we're getting there. So I want to develop some more of those for the course. Um, and how many hours is it? We haven't determined that. That has to go to IV and EV. When it's accredited, it goes through, but it's going to be a short course. And it's going to be, if you like this information and you want to deep dive and understand it a little bit more, it's ideal for that. Um, I think Virag asked a, a question before we actually started live, right at the top of the chat, and he was saying, what qualifications do you need? It, there, as long as you've studied to a certain level, there is no qualifications to do the course in natural balance motion. It's for anybody who's interested in understanding canine movement, uh, but it is in depth. Um, and obviously, um, it's an accredited course. You will have work to do and assignments. But anybody who's worked with me, you know that we create some really interesting assignments, um, which are great fun for reviewing and linking information and knowledge. And again, I think I forgot to time stamp that, Bernadette. So I've given the answer and I've done answering. So I'm really sorry I didn't time stamp that. OK, so four votes for when rehabbing an iliopsoas injury, how balanced do you make the exercises? Do you only strengthen the injured side or both sides? What if your dog has a bilateral injury, but one side is worse than the other? You know, that's a great question, Marie. Thank you for that, because that's really interesting because there's so many people who only address one side and you can easily overhab one section. So rather than looking at the iliopsoas injury, look at the impact as the major hip flexor that it has on movement. And so you would definitely want to look at your hip extensors, um, even though it's a hip flexor, but it's got to work in synchrony with the hip extensors. And your hip extensors are your main retractors of the hind limb. They're your power muscles, um, your hamstrings and your gluteals. So they will be very limited by your major hip flexor being injured. Um, and it also depends on the age of the dog, the segment of the dog. It depends on the role of the dog. So because we know muscle tone is different in young dogs, athletic dogs, older dogs. And you definitely want to look holistically at your dog as well as focally at, or locally at that injury. Bernadette, have you highlighted this question? I don't know how you highlight it. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Right, so I think I forgot to timestamp it again. I can timestamp it, but I don't know how to highlight it. I really apologize, Bernadette. I can read out the questions because what we're going to do now is we're going to look at, it's got one vote. How do you achieve, yeah, timestamp? I will try. Okay, thank you, Bernadette. Work me through this. Right, I have timestamped it. How do you achieve a balanced dog that consistently pulls forward in the underwater treadmill and has made it its priority to avoid any balance work and is a large breed dog? Karen, New Zealand, brilliant question. Thank you so much. So to help a dog find its balanced stand, we don't put it into a balanced stand. We guide the dog using a sternal therapeutic handbrake um, because we're actually going to break the dog 
on a key point of control on its core. We don't use the collar in any way. We would have to, if that's a problem because it's gone in the underwater treadmill and it's taking itself out of balance, Karen, I think it would be really helpful to do therapeutic handling, which incorporates T-touch, key points of control, movement shaping, um, and we can incorporate that in your clinic area before you take them into the underwater treadmill and use that as some movement shaping and you can do that to familiarize as a walkthrough as well and see how that goes. You need to find the appropriate and well-fitted Y-shaped harness for the dog and maybe try some different Y-shaped harnesses to help the dog find its balance. You can do some corridor work and movement shaping. That sometimes helps. Some dogs relax by moving and some dogs relax by and find their balance stand by putting the brake on the therapeutic brake. So I hope that gives you some ideas. If not, we can email me and we'll go through that. Load bearing, Lynn Lucas, hello, start answering. I am time stamping it. So the question is, would you mind talking a little about a bit about load bearing, please? Great question, Lynn, because I'm just going to come to that on my next few slides. We're going to have a little look at the biomechanical design of the dog and load bearing. So if I'm I'm just going to um, timestamp that we finish that and go on with the just shut that up and go on with the presentation. Okay. Right. Bear with me. I think I'm there, hopefully. Yes, hopefully. So your canine biomechanics are really different to yours. You are a biped. We have our head stacked on our shoulder, our shoulders stacked on our hips, and we are aligned and we are plantigrade. Dogs, quadruped, they have a completely different organization of their loading. Their forelimbs and their forequarters take about two thirds of their body weight and their hindquarters is the, the other third. So they distribute their weight equally in a balanced stand over four points. We distribute ours over two. As a quadruped, their positioning is really different. So what I want you to do is think about the dog as a car. So the chassis of the car is the skeleton. So the skeleton gives the dog the shape, the form, things can be attached to it, like your muscles, ligaments, tendons, fascia, um, and it protects things, um, but there's no power of movement from the skeleton. It does not move the dog. The joints, think of those as your car wheels. They're very organized with a complex linkage. Um, there's no power from a joint, but because they're loose links, they need extra supporting structures. And that's because the dog has four legs for two reasons. To support the dog against gravity, that's one force, okay? And also to support the dog through those ground reaction forces. So you've got these two equal and opposite forces. We've got gravity, which is constant force through our joints, and we've got the ground reaction forces, particularly the vertical ground reaction forces for dogs. So when a dog has an injury, when a dog has pain, when a dog maybe has a mechanical um, difference where it's offloading a leg because of leg shortening, the pattern that they will use to offload will be a flexor pattern. And the reason I mention this is because I've noticed there's a lot of information um, out there on social media about encouraging flexor patterns. Flexor patterns are what dogs use to offload and we want to improve their movement. So we're very concerned with the extensor pattern. So when we're using any kind of technique, we're encouraging a balanced stand using an extensor pattern because that's what they have to do to support themselves against gravity. So the anti-gravity muscles, which for the dog are going to be the hamstrings and the gluteals, the big power muscles on the hind limb. I don't know if you can see my arrow there, hamstrings and the gluteals. Okay, they're very key anti-gravity muscles linked to the gastrocnemius, linked to the calf muscles to support the dog up against gravity and to resist those ground reaction forces. You do not want to be encouraging flexor patterns. Flexor patterns are what dogs do to lift their legs up and clear the ground, ready for weight bearing. And then early stance, mid stance, from mid stance to push off is the retraction phase. So retraction is the power sweep. That's where the power of movement is. So that's where we want to be really emphasizing is from mid stance to their push off 
is their retraction and their power sweep. Whereas flexor patterns, when you look at a dog move, they use very little flexion in walking at any of their joints. In trotting, double the movement, double the force. So we don't want to be encouraging flexor patterns as therapists unless it's a local problem where we want to engage and get more appropriate range of motion of the joints. We do want to be very tuned in to getting a very balanced, extensive pattern in balance. That's different to an extensive thrust in panic. We want the dogs to move in confidence, consciously mediating, actively with us, trusting us and being guided by us because that's very proprioceptively enriched. A dog that comes in and is fooling around, messing around, jumping around, or going into flight or fright, they're survival modes. They're their innate defenses to get through experiences. We don't, as therapists, want dogs doing that. We want to help improve their movement significantly. So for that, we need them to be focused, be confident in us, and work with us. And it's a bond, that professional bond, which is so important. So where the power of movement comes from is the muscle system. And the muscle system, some muscles work very hard to give you stability so the other muscles can move part of the body. So we don't want to just think about the movement elements because without core stability and joint stability, the dog can't move. So your static work and your balance work and your coordination work is absolutely paramount before you then move that dog because you would want them to move in balance not take them out of balance. And just... So we do know from research, which is really fascinating, that wearing the appropriate harness significantly impacts the dog's natural balance motion. If they wear a Y-shaped harness where it rests, and it needs to be a well-fitted Y-shaped harness, obviously the skeleton, this is a close-up. There is a, sorry, Robert, there is a lot if talk about harness, steep. I'm really sorry, I can't see what you're saying there. Could you just say that again? So the harness, the style of the harness will impact whether the dog moves in balanced motion or not. So a Y-shaped balanced harness is going to help the dog move very efficiently in its natural balanced motion. Whereas if you wear a harness that impinges motion, can anybody see the cursor here? Can you see it on the picture? Anybody give me some feedback? Let me try on the other one. No, thank you, Tracy. Let me try on here. Can you see it now? No, no cursor. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you, Tracy. So I'm on the wrong one. So here we've got a Y-shaped harness and the front of the harness sits on the manubrium, sits on the sternum. It sits on a key point of control. Okay, and then the other part of the harness where we control the dog is on its core there. And so if we, you've frozen on my screen, have I? Okay, I've frozen on the screen. Hang on, thank you, Maria. How's that? Everybody else's screen all right? We've got a lot of people joining the room at the moment. All right, so you, you can hear the Y shape and strap across the chest. So what we're looking at is a Y shaped harness that sits on the manubrium, which is a key point of control for the dog, just as they've got several key points of control, just like humans have. However, the key points of control for a dog, like humans, can control a whole sequence of movement. So we use a sternal handbrake for therapeutic handling, which is part of movement enrichment. Thank you, Maria. We're back. And we, we use that. We've got several different kinds of sternal handbrakes that we use on that key point of control that the dog recognizes innately to understand it's its handbrake. We also control the dog from the core. So by taking every tension off the collar, we can help the dog find its natural balance stand. If you wear a harness that comes across the shoulder, uh, comes across the shoulders, comes lower down, like the second harnesses or the anti-pull harnesses, you are taking the dog out of balance. It's like uh, it's like um, wearing a really tight-fitting long coat and trying to stride out in it. 
it's not preventing the dog from pulling, it's going to take the dog out of balance and they're going to accommodate by some of their spinal movement, which we don't want. It's not that useful um, for the dog. So by finding, there's lots of different Y-shaped harnesses, by finding the right fit, just like you have several pairs of shoes, you get the best fit for you, you need to find the right fit for the dog. And by using that, and as a therapist, an owner, a trainer, then using that to um, move the dog in is going to make a big difference. So Robert, a buoyancy aid, you're getting there. Would a buoyancy aid design cause the same problem as swimming as the harness? Okay, so let's think about this. A really good question, and I did try and answer that, and I'm, I'm getting better at the IT, but it does throw me a bit, so thank you for hanging in there. I've noticed no one's left the room, so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I feel blessed so many people are listening to this. We do not use buoyancy aids, full stop. We know from science that wearing a buoyancy aid, which is bulky, okay, it limits movement. It also switches off the epaxial muscles. The epaxial muscles are the muscles Again, I'm going to try and do my cursor on the other picture. Uh, running alongside the spine here. The epaxial muscles are absolutely key for core stability in the dog as a quadruped. They come down here, they start there in the neck, they come along and they're all the way along. They are the key core stabilizers. We don't have that many issues cranially with stability because there's the ribs and we've got a very strong intercapital lig ligament but where we have masses of issues with the dog is the caudal core and so these epaxials by putting on a buoyancy aid you switch them off by about 50 60 percent okay so you know that if you if you're in a buoyancy aid you're you're hampered it's restrictive you can't move in balance definitely without a doubt you're going to have to do an awful lot more work in a buoyancy aid to have any impact on the movement. And we are seeing improvements in hydrotherapy with that. So just imagine if you took off those flotation devices and actually allowed the epaxial muscles to work, particularly as a um, neurophysio human and a neurospecialist in veterinary um, physiotherapy. We never, ever put any flotation device on a spinal case because it will be detrimental to their rehab. It's going to take so much longer to get there. So we definitely use a harness in the pool and it's, it's going to be a well-fitted Y-shaped harness. And we've got a whole variety because dogs come in all different shapes and sizes. And we want a well-fitted harness so we can guide the dog through the water using movement shaping, using therapeutic handling, key points of control. We incorporate T-touch, which is a massive element within um, therapeutic handling inspired by Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais was all about, Mosh Feldenkrais was all about body awareness. These are techniques that physios have been using um, in the um, 70s and 80s, because I, I trained in the 70s, I was working in 1983. Mosh Feldenkrais was inspirational for movement therapies. Um, so we definitely don't use flotation jackets. We definitely advocate a really well-fitted Y-shaped harness for that particular dog. I hope that um, answers your question, Andrew. Any more questions, please put them in ask a question so I don't miss, miss them. So I'm just going to go back to the last few slides. Thank you, Andrew. Right, so this is where it gets really interesting. So we now need to think about so many people over challenge the proprioceptive system because they've read somewhere that that's gonna help the dog. So what we need to do is we need to not over challenge the dog. We need the dog to consciously mediate, actively work with us in a focused, calm way. We've got this enormous body of research supporting how brilliant Pilates is, how brilliant Tai Chi sequences of movement are. We need the dog to be confident and work with us actively. And we achieve that through therapeutic handling when we're working with the dog. And we teach this to our owners. We teach this to everybody. Um, now we could bring in a ramp. Now, don't bring in your ramps and your wobble boards and everything too soon, because what we need to think about is what's happening on the ramp if the dog just walks on it. So with therapeutic handling in balanced movement, we can use ramps to when you go up a ramp to do concentric work. And when you come down a ramp in balanced motion, you're going to be doing eccentric loading, which is fantastic for the dog. But before we get to movement, because everybody rushes to movement, let's think about some static work. So with the picture with the boxer, 
you can see that we've got some we've got some balanced work here. It's a static posture, and we can do some movement shifts. And remember, human physios, we do a lot of side to side. We don't do that with canines. We don't do that with dogs. We're going forward and backward because it's about protraction, retraction. It's about flexion, extension. They don't have rotational elements in their joints like we do. So again, using our balance rhythmical stabilizations in preference to balance reactions, because anything where you knock a dog over or you knock a dog out of balance, that's a reflex. We don't want to do that. What we want them to do is we want them to engage in balance and work with us in balance. So we're going to use rhythmical stabilizations, which are absolutely awesome. So yeah, thinking about ramps, and this is how you would graduate it. When the dog can move in balance on land, on the flat, then we can think about making it more complicated, but definitely less is more. So when we've got them in their static work and we build the isometric exercises up and we're starting to think about movement, we want to do some balanced dynamic posture in a sequence. And to do that, we can guide them with movement shaping, with therapeutic handling, with two point control. And we've also incorporated a proprioceptive track. And what that does is that gives lots of proprioceptive information up through the paws. So we're making an experience that's making the proprioceptive system come on board and tune in. So when the dog is off lead, proprioceptive system is off. When the dog is on lead, it's kind of on standby. If you do some of this stuff that's proprioceptively enriching, it is whirring. We're tuning up that system and we're making the dog find and rebalance and find its balance so it can move and be the very best version of itself. So any more questions? I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for bearing with me with my IT challenges. It hasn't put me off doing these, but it's very nerve wracking. But I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for the questions. We're gonna have a look, there's five more questions in the moment. This dog, a soulmate of mine, 15 and a half years old. How can you not love it? Thank you, Robert, I hope that helped. Um, and I'm going to go into the questions and yes, Bernadette, I'm going to try really hard to timestamp them. So what is the best way, hang on, timestamp them. What is the best way to find out if a dog has a natural balanced motion? So it's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Richard. So to feel that's as a therapist, we feel the dog go into balance. We help them and guide them to maintain that balance. We find that balance statically. We find that in different postures, we work on their different postures, their transitions. And then when we actually move the dog, we're going to move them in balance. And we can do that with close work. Thank you, Patrick, opening new ideas. It's great to hear that. So we can do that with close work where we're attached, we're holding the harness and we're doing some close work. We can do that at slight distance with short leads. We can do that with long distance. Thank you, Heather. It's really nice to know. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I know it's a bit different. I know it's going to be a bit different for some people to hear some of this. But it's exciting because it's what's making such a difference to so many thousands of dogs that we see in all the different people who've come and trained at Canine HS courses. We see that. So, and then we can work at longer distance. And we're going to make a unique package there, Richard, for each individual dog because we know every dog is so different. They're different shape ways, they're, sh they're different personality ways, they're different. Um, movement ways and it depends on their signalment, their age, their needs. So we're going to fashion a unique movement therapy program to meet the assessment needs that we found out. So there isn't the best way, there's lots of ways to do it. It's trying to choose ways that really work with the dog, not on the dog. It's trying to look at it globally and then also locally. I hope that helped. Um, any more questions? Right. I think I've answered that one. Any more questions coming through? I've got five here. Let me just check I haven't missed anything. Ah, whoa, Patrick, that's, that's a great question. Where do I start? Okay, what is the importance of blindfolded exercise? I work with the iMove Balance platform. Okay, I'm putting it out there. I would never, ever blindfold a dog. 
I can see how some information might get out there where they feel that's going to help with balance. I want the dog to be able to recruit its proprioceptors in its eyes. I want the dog to be able to recruit the receptors in its vestibular apparatus, its inner ear. I want it to be able to see its horizon and I want it to actively work with me to adjust its movement. And that can be in a sit, in a lie, in a stand. I would never take away the proprioceptors that its brain needs to use because my concern would be you're going to move that dog into a reflexive reaction where it's got to hang in there or you're going to lose its confidence that it's got choices. So I don't feel using a blindfold is important. I, I think it's a worry that people maybe are using that and we would, we would never advocate that. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to be so blunt with that, but it's just something that I would want the dog to be able to use all of its proprioceptors um, so it can find its natural balance motion, so it can enjoy its life and have a great time and in rehabilitation, acquire that in a few sessions, not have to go to numerous sessions because we can teach so much of this to the owners. Owners are brilliant. They want to be empowered and know what to do. Um, <laughs> not blunt needs to be said. Thank you, Bernadette. As you know, I do say it as it is. So I've time stamped that. Extensive patterns. Is it wrong to work over poles with a dog? Right. OK, another really good one. I'm really sorry. I think your name is Law or Laurie. I'm not sure how to pronounce, pronounce your name. I do apologize. Um, you said you spoke about extensive patterns. Is it wrong to work over poles with a dog who had an FHO? I'm not saying what's right and wrong. I'm going to share how we work and we get the most astonishing results. So I don't, when we use poles, I'm not thinking of the flexor pattern. I'm thinking of the balance and the placement. And when you have a flexor pattern, that's where your leg is protracting, moving into slight flexion to clear it. And then where it places down, that's what I'm really, my clinical intention is really focused on the quality of the extensor pattern and for the dog to proprioceptively place its paw. So proprioceptive paw placements, awesome treatment techniques. You can do them on land, you can do them in water, have the most astonishing results because they activate the proprioceptive system, they waken up and they raise the body awareness, particularly for the dog of the hind limbs. I hope that helps. I'm getting into the time stamping here, right. Um, I think that's all the questions that I've got here. If there's any more questions, do put them in. If you've enjoyed this session and you would like some more of this, please do give some feedback to me. Um, that really helps us. So I want to tell you about one of the questions we've been asked. Oh, Charlene. Yes, Charlene. Let me go and find your um, question. Sorry, have I missed it? Ah, there we go. So Charlene has asked, time stamp. I'm really interested in reading any research papers related to jackets switching off epaxials when swimming. Please, can you suggest further reading? There's a huge amount of um, work done on the epaxials in dogs. Um, I think if you go to Liverpool University, they've got some great biomechanists there. Um, you need to go and look outside of the areas that you routinely look at. So you'll never find an answer in one research paper. You've got to multi-research, multi-source. You can start with PubMed, Google Scholar, um, but go and look at the mathematical side and the biomechanical side. There's a huge amount of research that doesn't come into our therapy box that you can miss. And that's where I've um, picked up so many amazing um, bits of information. So one question I've been unindated with since last time is about CPD certificates. So, oh, what about the one that said about turning off by 50, 60%? It's not one paper, Charlene, it's several papers. And so what happens is research asks a little question and then someone over, so this is gathered over 20 years of reading loads of different articles by loads of leading people. Um, and I've been very influenced by Alan Wilson, Professor Alan, Alan Wilson, who's at the Royal Veterinary College um, and some awesome people. So. Um, maybe email me and I can direct you to having a look, but it's really exciting to kind of read 
um, various articles, maybe start a journal club with some friends where you can kind of start sourcing different bits of information and putting them together. It's like a jigsaw. And so if you like puzzles, it's great. So all I've done today is give you just some core pieces of your jigsaw, just a few edges and a few corners. I hope that um, helps. Any other questions I've missed, please tell me. Um, and I will come back to that. But I just want to tell you about the CPD certificates because we were inundated by support questions from the January live event. And I was staggered. Um, I have overrun. I was meant to do an hour, just noticed. So the next one we're going to do um, is, it's a live chat and it's gonna be on canine therapeutic palpation skills. And what we've been doing since January, we've been really busy. And what we've done is we've built a resource page on our website and it's k9hscourses.com. And if you go to the website, I'm afraid it's not mobile friendly. We tested it today. We are getting a mobile friendly version next week. But if you go through using your laptop um, and if you go using um, or your PC or your Mac and go on to k9hscourses.com. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. You can click onto the website. There's a resources page. If you go to the resources page, you can request your CPD. Now, it's an awesome thing. It's gone live yesterday. Please be patient with us. CPD is not about collecting certificates. CPD is exciting, it's what we plan. So when you've got a qualification and you want to progress or you want to advance, you start planning ahead. So I'm a gardener and I'm planning ahead in last year what I'm gonna grow this year. It's the same with your career, it's a career journey. Enjoy your career journey and plan what you want to go and do. But collecting certificates is not your CPD. And I know a lot of you have had problems where you've presented the CPD that you've done an hour here and um, it hasn't been, um, they've, they've requested a certificate to verify it. So some of your associations will accept like a screenshot of the um, webinar or a screenshot or a ticket if you've gone to an event. Um, others insist on a certificate. So this is where you can go and claim your certificate for the January and the beta course that we did in November and also you can claim for tonight. And I've put it all in one package. So your actual CPD is what you do with this information. So we've got a little section there. It's not feedback for us. What it is, is for you to reflect and think about how has this information impacted your work, your work with your dog, your um, how is it impacted in your decision making on what clinical skill you might choose? How has it impacted using a seminar where you haven't had to travel and you can access it in another country? So it can be a sentence, a few words, it could be a paragraph. So you enter your reflection, that goes nowhere, it's just an, it's an actual thing that you've done and then you can go through on the type form and you should get a acknowledgement that you've asked for your CPD certificate and then you should, hopefully, all being well, get your CPD certificate sent to you as an email which you can print off and then present to your associations if you would like or if you want to keep it in your portfolio or you can um, save it and put it into your LinkedIn profile. So we're just trying to meet that criteria for you. And as I said, it's not mobile friendly, so please don't go and do that on a mobile yet, but you can do that through our website. <laughs> Bernadette, oh my God, certificates, you just work so hard for everyone else. I know, but it's worth it because we all love dogs and it's fantastic. Um, Robert, another one, how would you adjust this for a dog with a missing limb? We have lots of tripods. Um, you just have to use an appropriate um, Y-shaped harness and we get great results where we use that for them to find their balance as a tripod rather than, especially if they're an exuberant Labrador pulling you all over the place, you know, or a Spaniel dashing around everywhere. So it works exactly the same. So the next Crowdcast, please, if you're interested, please do um, sign up for it. I'm really interested to know what else you would like. So do you want muscle injuries? You know, tell me what you're looking for. Do you want some treatment techniques? Do you want to know about the therapeutic external handbrake? What is it you would like? Um, oh, hi, Jane. 
Welcome, welcome, don't worry. The replay is literally available two minutes after this if I get this right, when I end the broadcast. So let me know if you felt this was useful. Some feedback would be fantastic in the um, box, in the chat box on the right. And just gonna have a little look at the poll, where we are at with the poll. Labrador Retrievers, way out in front. Border Collies, really doing really well. Spaniels, German Shepherds, Terriers, others. So we're gonna run some interesting polls on the next one as well. Therapeutic palpation techniques. We're thinking of everything we use, therapeutic touch, where every therapeutic touch counts, which is what we're all about. And as you sign off, it would be great if you give me some feedback or if you want to give me some feedback about other topics you would like to cover. So I really appreciate you all turning out. We've had 78 people live, which is fantastic. Uh, we started with 78. Muscle injuries would be great. I'd love to do muscle injuries, so that would be fantastic. So we might do that um, the, in April. We may aim for that for April. Pros and cons of taping, Jane, that will be really interesting. We can do that because taping is a really big deal. We use it hugely in humans. They use it a lot in horses. Interesting to look at how it affects natural balance movement in dogs and their coat. So that might be something that's topical. Um, and anything else, I'm just having a look at the chat, you'd like about pain management. One of my massive topics, I adore pain management. There's so much we can do. It's really, really topical at the moment. That's fantastic. Um, if you want some hydrotherapy, water management, building your practice, the do's and don'ts, where to save money, what to invest in when you set up a center. It's really hard for people who've been training as a therapist and then don't get the opportunity to have a clinical practice because it's so hard to set up and move from um, the university courses or the courses they've been on. Neurological cases, I'm a neurophysio, how can I say no? Therapeutic handling, I would so love to tell you that. So therapeutic handling is part of movement enrichment. Movement enrichment involves therapeutic handling and clinic enrichment. Movement enrichment is the in thing. It's astonishingly brilliant. I can't wait to share that with you. Um, setting up your practice, Dave Taylor says, pool sizes and their effects on treatment. Robert, that's a great one. You might want to look at one of the other, I think it was last month's um, Crowdcast. We did some mention about pool sizes. You know, remember the underwater treadmill, you can make such a huge difference to the dog. Hydro pools are small. They are not big pools. You don't want something big. It's costly, lots of chemicals, lots of heating. A risk assessment, Richard, of course, why not? Because risk assessment's key, because at the bottom line, it's always about safe practice. And risk assessment, which can be dynamic risk assessment, essential for therapists, as well as at leisure risk assessment, is key to safe practice. And we want those dogs to have amazing benefits from our treatments. So I'm gonna sign off for now. Water management, water management, I can do, Tracy, no problem with that. I kind of look at it as water management solutions because everyone's got problems. So we can go forward. As I said, some feedback if you found it helpful would be fantastic. I'll see you next month. I really look forward to it. Bye for now. Cheerio.